Hello guys and welcome back to Sonic Origins. In the last episode, if you don't remember, we unlocked Hypersonic, an evolved form of Supersonic. Uh, we collected all of the Super Emeralds instead of the Chaos Emeralds, and we got access to this new, most likely seizure-inducing power. Uh, in this episode, we're going through Flying Battery. So this is the second uh, zone of Sonic and & Knuckles. And it once again falls under that sort of category of levels that made me quit when I was a kid. Um, just because this stage is very hard. Again, it's supposed to be at the very end of the game because Sonic 3 and Knuckles are one huge game. But for child me who just wanted to play through Sonic and Knuckles and just have a fun time there, this was an aggravating level. Music-wise, this level kicks so much ass. It is so cool. But yeah, I think, like, as a concept, this, like, you know, on top of a floating airship is really cool. We've kind of already done this idea in Sonic 2, but that was very, like, that was a very short zone. We only got one act, and it was a very, very short act at that. Um, so we get this. We also get more of this in um, Sonic Adventure, but hey, Sonic and Knuckles did it first, so... I think this zone also has a bit of trouble with uh, just random things crushing you out of nowhere. So I'll have to definitely look out for that. I don't have this zone's layout memorized like I do some other zones in Sonic Origins, so you might have to bear with me for a second, because I'm still kind of feeling my way through this. Did... Holy crap, Hypersonic just takes, like, the the missiles there like they're absolutely nothing. That's so cool. Oh, here's the capsule. I guess we didn't have to fight a boss this time. Just kidding. So for this guy, you have to go ahead and move out of the way of his swinging arms. Or if you're in Hypersonic mode, you can just kind of stand here. I'm actually running out of rings, so I'll have to actually jump out of the way in just a second. I have a shield, so I won't have to worry too much about this. Oh, I haven't mentioned the shields yet, by the way. Uh, in the previous Sonic games, there was only one shield, just the normal shield that just gives you an extra hit. In Sonic 3 Knuckles, you get three shields. There's the fire shield, which is the one that I have that gives you this boost forward ability. It's kind of like what Hypersonic has, except, you know, uh, it doesn't, you know, make the entire screen flash. There's the Bubble Shield, which allows you to, like, bounce on the ground and gain additional height. And also, I think it lets you breathe underwater, which is really cool. And then there's the Electric Shield, which... I can go ahead and show off right now. Uh, it draws rings towards you, which is a super cool feature, and it allows you to get into hypersonic mode really, really easily. It also has an additional jump. So... Yeah, you can double jump with the shield. This is an instance of something that can like easily crush you if you're going through this really fast and not really paying attention. I haven't gone back to play the original Sonic 3 and Knuckles in so long, so I wonder if all of like the stuff that crushes, crushes you really easily. I wonder if that's just a Sonic Origins thing, or if it's also present in the original. I genuinely have no clue. One thing that I probably should have referenced in a previous um, episode is uh, during the carnival level from Sonic 3, uh, there's this barrel, and it's a very infamous barrel because it has a specific mechanic where you're supposed to stand on top of it and then uh, repeatedly press up and down to try to make it move up and down. Uh, and it's not very well explained, so a lot of people like got stuck on that barrel and just didn't know how to progress through the game. And it became very infamous, it became a meme. I think like Sega even made an official like coffee mug with the barrel's design on it. So something that I'm not very uh, well versed in, like off the top of my head, is... Um, each game has a cheat code that allows you to get to the level select, and that's something that I used a lot for some of these games because 
you know, back when we didn't have continues, I just used the level select in order to, in order to, you know, regain my progress without having to play through the entire game again. Also, here's the, like, laser prison from Sonic 2 back with a vengeance. Um, yeah, during this next act, act I'll go ahead and uh, talk about what those different uh, cheat codes are, because I remember some of them were really iconic and some of them were really dumb and weird. I feel like I keep describing things with, like, really harsh language when I don't mean to, so apologies for that. I'll just say some of the codes were a bit weird. It's currently 3 a.m. when I'm recording this, so my brain isn't, like, functioning entirely the way it's supposed to. Um, so my brain just forgets to properly search for the correct words that I want to use at the moment. Oh, crap. Oh, I wish I had kept my fire shield because that makes this boss fight so much easier. Because then you don't have to worry about it sp uh, spitting out fire. Gotta wait. There we go. That wasn't too bad. I only got hit like once. I forget, was that Act 1 or Act 2? That was Act 2. Holy heck. That zone was over so much quicker than I thought it would be. Sandopolis Zone. Okay, I never really like uh, sandy areas in video games. In Mario games, sandy areas are always like the second world in games, like up until like Mario Bros. Wonder. Yeah, I never really like desert areas. Like, I guess they're cool in concept, but I don't know. They're just not really fun to look at, to me, at the very least. I know it's a lot, I know, I'm sure a lot of people have differing opinions to that, but that's just for me. Gameplay, like, level design-wise, though, this entire thing also sucks, especially Act 2, but we'll get to that in a second. Very interesting thing is that uh, whenever Sonic games are made, sometimes level orders are swapped around uh, before the final game is released. For example, uh, in the original Sonic one, I mentioned this, Labyrinth Zone was originally going to be the second stage, but due to its difficulty, it got pushed back to being the fifth stage, or zone. Or no, was that fourth stage, rather. Or zone. I keep saying stage, why? Another instance of this can be seen uh, at the very end of the flying battery zone. Uh, you'll see that, like, Sonic, like, kicks open a door and then jumps out, and then now we're in Sandopolis. Originally, that supposedly wasn't going to be the case. That door was going to be the thing that you used to snowboard at the beginning of Ice Cap Zone. But, you know, they moved things around, and so in the final game, we have that transition, but ultimately it's in the wrong place. I do believe there are like, mods and, uh, you know, fan games that restore all of the levels in the proper place, so... Uh, if you're curious about that, go ahead and look it up online. Anyways, I'll go and I'll go ahead and go into further detail about the cheat codes that I was gonna talk about in just a sec. I completely forgot to talk about those, so here you go. So if you actually want to learn more about the cheat codes and you know what they are, then I'd highly suggest checking out the Cutting Room Floor website because you know it lists you know what the cheat code is, how to input it, and uh, stuff like that. I just want to share a bit of fun trivia. First of all, the one from Sonic 1. That one doesn't have too much trivia behind it because it's just a basic hold down A on the title screen and then you press a few buttons and then you hear a noise and then you press start. Interesting thing though, it has what seems to be what the original level order was supposed to be before the game got uh, fully released because originally Labyrinth Zone was supposed to come before Marble Zone and that's how it's listed on the level select. 
So it's very interesting to see. Also apparently, also apparently a couple other levels got switched around. Um, and then for Sonic 2, what you have to do for that one is you have to go to the sound test and you have to input a series of numbers. And I'm pretty sure that series of numbers is actually Yuji Naka's birthday, which I think is a fun little Easter egg. The cheat code for Sonic the Hedgehog 3 is... It's a normal cheat code, like the way that it's entered in is normal and I don't think there's really an Easter egg to it. But it's always been infamous in my mind because it is almost impossible, at least for me, it's almost impossible to put it in because you have such a short amount of time to actually put it in. So yeah, I was never able to do it as a kid. And then in Sonic and Knuckles, that one's very interesting because it's the only one to my knowledge where you have to actually start up the game uh, and start playing before you input the cheat code because you have to start up Sonic and Knuckles and I think go to one of those like, uh, you know those things where it's like Sonic's on the like pulley system thing and you have to keep pressing down in order to make Sonic rise up. Um, Basically, you have to jump onto that and input the cheat code there. And then finally, here's a bonus one. This game isn't even in the Sonic Origins collection or a part of the trilogy in any way. But Sonic 3D Blast is very interesting because, um, first of all, I used that cheat code constantly throughout my playthrough of the game, my personal playthrough, just because I was never able to beat that game without you know, getting constant game overs and being sent all the way back to the start, and it just sucked. But apparently the cheat code is supposed to spell out the word Barracuda, because I think the cheat code is B, A, right, A, C, up, down, A. But it's slightly misspelled, because I think there's supposed to be an extra R or something like that, which I think is very interesting. It makes it really easy to remember, though. Because with the other cheat codes where you have to input a random series of uh, buttons or numbers, it can get kind of hard to remember. But you just have to vaguely remember how to spell Barracuda and make sure you misspell it. And then, yeah, that's the cheat code. Alright, so you remember how at the very beginning of Sonic CD we ran into the EGG HVC We ran into the EGG HVC 001 and I said that that was the easiest boss fight in Sonic history This is probably the second easiest uh, You don't have to attack it Just stand to the left of it. It's gonna keep jumping And you just slowly wait for it to jump into the sand And now we just gotta jump over here and just wait for it to jump. There we go, and that's the entire boss fight done. Yeah, it's kinda... Sandopolis zone isn't a very fun zone to play through, and the boss fights don't make it any better. I think if the boss fights were something really cool and unique and fun, then I might have been like, oh, well, you know, at least, at least we have that. But we don't have that. We've just got this. So the whole point of, the whole gimmick of Act 2 of Sandopolis Zone is that um, the lights keep going out. And so you have to, uh, you know, just keep turning the lights back on. And then when it gets too dark, these ghost enemies appear, which I actually think have uh, adorable designs. Uh, like those guys up there. Uh, they just like start attacking you and stuff like that, so you just have to keep the whole place bright. One thing that people complained about with Marble Zone was that it was very slow, and one of the things that made it slow was having to push those blocks, like, constantly. Sandopolis Zone Act 2 makes that, like, a major mechanic now, like, throughout the entire act. And it's kind of obnoxious, if I'm being completely honest. It sucks that I can't really be positive about this level, but it's just... It's just not all that fun to me. Uh, let me know in, in the comments if you're a big... 
Let me know in the comments if you're a big Sandopolis fan. I just realized that I haven't talked in the past, like, few minutes because I just... My brain just blanked out because I was just... Just doing the level and just trying to get through it as quickly as I could. So, for Hydro City Zone, uh, I know that, like, the pronunciation of that has been debated a lot by fans. But for me, I always, like, go for official sources when it comes to pronunciation. Uh... And, 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 you know, sometimes I accidentally get stuck on my old way of pronouncing it, but I always try my best to, uh, pronounce it cor pr pronounce it correctly, quote-unquote. So, I'm pretty sure it's been confirmed that it's supposed to be Hydro City, and I think the Japanese pronunciation, uh, is how it's supposed to be pronounced. I pronounce, uh, I've started pronouncing the, you know, move it, funny moving these funny moving images that you'll see online as GIFs, because I'm pretty sure that's how the original creator wanted them to be pronounced. I also always try to go for, um, if the game was originally made in Japan, and I don't know how to pronounce something, like a name or something like that, I'll check the Japanese pronunciation and see how they pronounce it. For example, uh, Goto from the third Ace Attorney game, when I get around to that game, I'm going to be pronouncing his name as Goto. Uh, some people pronounce it as Gato because his name is based off of um, the original, you know, the play Waiting for Gato, where that's how it's pronounced. Um, and then some people pronounce it as Gado because that's how, I'm pretty sure that's how Americans, like, just decided it was pronounced for some reason. Um, and then the Ace Attorney anime officially officially pronounces it, pronounces it as Godot, but uh, his name was originally written in Japan as Goto. Uh, at least that's how it'd be pronounced in Japanese. I'm pretty sure. Again, I d I don't know Japanese, but from what I've like, but I have like a very like a very very basic like understanding of how things are supposed to be pronounced, and I think that's how you'd pronounce it. And then in Ace Attorney 4, uh, there's Maki Tobai, who I've heard a ton of different pronunciations for his name. Uh, I've heard his first name be pronounced as uh, Maki, Machi, uh, Machi, I think I've even heard once. And then for... Uh, also, by the way, I kind of take back what I said about the boss fights in this zone earlier. This is pretty cool. This reminds me of the Egg Golem from Sonic Adventure 2. And for his last name, I've pronounced- I've heard people pronounce it as Tobai, or Tobaye, or Tobay, or some other weird pronunciation. But yeah, I, I do believe in Japan, his name is Maki Tobayu. So, I'll pronounce his name as Maki Tobai when I get around to Let's Playing that game. But yeah, we're done with Sandopolis Zone, and now we're moving on to, into Lava Reef Zone. Uh, this first act is pretty good. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, aside from, like, the final final zone, this is, like, the re last, like, real zone uh, in Sonic 3 and Knuckles. You remember how the last real zone of Sonic 2 was... Metropolis Zone, and then we just got Sky Chase, and we got the uh, Flying Fortress, and then we got the Death Egg Zone, um, which were all, like, not not full-on zones, just, like, mini ones. That's pretty much the same thing that we're gonna get here. This is the last, like, big major one. We've got a few small ones that we're gonna uh, finish up, and then we'll move on to the end of the game. I still have no idea if I'm gonna cut this into... Uh, one episode, one episode or two episodes for the finale. You know what I think? Uh, next episode might be the finale. Because I've been going on for about 25 minutes uh, as of now. And I still have to get through this, a few more zones. Uh, still, and we still have one, like, major big zone. And then we'll finish up everything, uh, in the next episode. Going back on the topic of, uh, you'll remember how 
in a previous episode, I uh, referenced the Ace Attorney timeline that was officially re officially released. I've seen a lot of posts being like, why isn't Professor Layton versus Phoenix Wright on this list? Why isn't it there? And it's like, because it's not an Ace Attorney game. Or at least not like a canon one. It doesn't, It they didn't put it on the timeline because it wouldn't make any sense. They cross, they meet Professor Layton in that game. Of course it's not canon. I feel like if you put Professor Layton versus Phoenix Wright on the timeline, you'd also probably have to put stuff like Marvel versus Capcom 3 and Project Cross Zone 2 on there. Which would mean that Majima and Kiryu from the Yakuza series are canon to the Ace Attorney series. And that Phoenix has canonically defended Galactus. I still haven't gotten around to uh, Project Cross, Cross Zone 2 yet. Um, because I need to play more, like, Capcom games. I haven't finished Resident Evil yet, um, or any Resident Evil game. Uh, I've only gotten, like, a tiny bit into the remake of Resident Evil 1, and a tiny bit into the remake of Resident Evil 2, and a tiny bit into Resident Evil 4, and I stopped, like, uh, midway through all of those. So I'll need to get around to finishing those someday. Uh, I've played through the... Uh, Yakuza slash Like a Dragon games, or at least a few of those, which those are technically Sega properties, so I guess I also need to play more Sega games as well. And then of course I played the Ace Attorney games, uh, which you should too, by the way, go check it out if you haven't. Um, all of the games, uh, or at least the canon ones, uh, are on modern consoles right now. Uh, this sounds like I'm doing an ad read, but no, I just love this franchise. But yeah, it's really great to have all the Ace Attorney games on modern consoles and stuff like that, because, as I've probably mentioned in the past, Ace Attorney is one of my favorite series of all time, and it's just so super duper cool to, to see that everyone else is able to play it too. I guess I'll take a side tangent here to talk about another blue guy with spiky hair. If you want to get into the Phoenix Wright games, best place to start is always the original trilogy, the Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney trilogy. Release order... Which I always, whenever I'm suggesting to people, like, Hey, here's how you should play the series. Here's the order you should play everything in. I always go with release order because that's how it was intended to be experienced and so you don't get spoiled uh, by looking at prequels and stuff like that. Release order for Ace Attorney is Ace Attorney 1 through 4, then the two Investigations games, then Ace Attorney 5, then the Great Ace Attorney 1, then Ace Attorney 6, in the Great Ace Attorney 2. Um, which is fine when they're all individual games, but I realize it can be kind of silly if you're playing through the collections, because that would mean that you'd have to buy and play through the or original trilogy, like, all in a row, and that's completely fine. And then you'd buy the Apollo Justice trilogy, play through the first game in that collection, and then you'd have to buy another collection to play through the two Investigations games and then play through Ace Attorney 5, and then buy another collection, play one of the games from that, then play Ace Attorney 6, and then play the last game in the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles collection. And you can technically do that if you want, that's probably the best experience, but in case you're like, I can only buy one collection at a time and I want to play through an entire collection before moving on to the next one instead of swapping back and forth between them, then I'd highly suggest playing through the original trilogy first, then the Investigation Duology, then the Apollo Justice Trilogy, and then the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Because there's some there's some slight stuff from Dual Destinies that, you know, kind of sort of builds off of the Investigations Duology, and I just overall think it's better to play the Investigations games before Ace Attorneys 5 and 6. And plus, that's when it chronologically takes place, uh, the Investigations duology. They take place shortly after Game 3, and uh, a while before Ace Attorney 4. And the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, you could technically play those at any time, because they take place in the distant past, like the late 19th century or something like that. And it doesn't really have any connections to the uh, main series of games, or the Investigations games. But I always, I'd always suggest playing those last, just because they're the most advanced out of all of the Ace Attorney games. Apologies to anyone who is co who was coming into these latter videos, hoping that uh, that I would just like strictly talk about 
uh, Sonic Origins and not much else. But that's not really my commentary style. I just like to talk about whatever comes to mind. And I like, I have like weird interests and stuff like that. And I'm always trying to like talk about stuff like that. So apologies for that. Um, this is just my style of commentary. Apologize if it's, I apologize if it's not really to your tastes. So we're in Lava Reef Zone Act 2, which I think is cooler than Act 1. I think it's a bit more difficult in terms of gameplay, obviously, because it's the, the one after, it's the second one. But I like this one a lot more because of the backgrounds. The backgrounds are so cool. Like, you see, like, the volcano, like, all of the bits of the volcano, because I'm pretty sure we're supposed to be in a volcano, right? Uh, you see all of that in the background, and it just looks so pretty. And then... We're going to get more into, like, the backgrounds as we get later into the level, so stay tuned for that, I guess. I'm surprised I got through that fire without getting hurt. I think it's maybe because I pressed the A button at the exact same time that I was going through that. Um, because, for those of you who don't know, if you don't have a shield in Sonic 3, if you press A while you're in the air, Sonic just has this kind of weird, like, thing around him. I don't know how to describe that, but it allows him to attack enemies, and I guess maybe that helped him get through the fire there, too? I got very lucky, though, because, like, that, like, shield only pops up for maybe half a second. <laughs> I don't watch too much anime or read too much manga, and I kind of want to change that a bit, because well, there is a lot of, like, because that's what a, a lot of people online do like to talk about, is, like, cool new manga and anime and stuff like that. But I just don't have a lot of history with anime and stuff like that. The only stuff that I watched as a child was um, Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. And I'll get back to this topic in, in like just a second, or maybe in the next episode. Um, but speaking, referring back to like our talks about backgrounds and stuff like that, this is so cool, seeing the death egg up close like this. Like, in the top of the volcano there, and then Knuckles comes down, he knocks us off of the platform here, and then we get this background, which is just the sickest thing ever. I love it so much. Ow! Alright, I have to actually be careful because I don't have hypersonic with me at the moment. And I'm not very skilled at this boss fight because I usually do have hypersonic with me. Oh, sorry, Tails. Death by screen not scrolling far enough. Alright, we've got Hypersonic again. We've also got the Fire Shield, so I can just jump down here and wait for the boss fight to appear. Come on, where is it? Gotta wait for all of the platforms to fall down real quick. Also, sorry, Tails, you have to keep standing on hot lava. I'm so glad that rings aren't shared in normal play like this, because that would be the most obnoxious stuff in the world. Come on! Oh, I guess I needed to walk over here. I guess the cutscene only starts when you're standing on the platform or something like that. Anyways. I probably could have stayed in the fire shield, but I forgot that you don't attack it directly. You just wait for the spike balls to run into it. I guess I could just stand in the corner, though. That's kind of funny. I could just stand still for this entire boss fight and just wait for it to be over. He's actually taking a lot more hits than I thought he would, so I might have to actually start playing in just a second, because we are very quickly running out of rings. Okay, I still have the fire shield, so thank gosh for that.
This is very cool, getting to stand in the lava. It's a bit annoying to hear Tails being damaged every two seconds, but that's fine. Anyways, the lava, I think, cools over once you're... once you hit this capsule here. Yeah, it does. Lava Reef is just really, really cool. Just from a visual standpoint and from a... from an I... from, like, an idea standpoint. Just standing in the middle of an active volcano is so... freaking sweet. Hidden Palace Zone. This is something that may sound familiar. This was the hidden level in Sonic 2. Uh, it makes a reappearance as an actual, like, level here. Um, well, less, less of a level, but more of a... Well, you'll see in the next episode. We've been going on for a real long time now, so thank you guys all so much for watching. And in the next episode, we are going to finish off Sonic Origins. Hopefully. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to do that. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye!